In this week's episode, I review the Canon XA10. We talk about the rule of thirds and go over different camera bags to keep your gear protected. DVTV starts right now. This episode is made possible in part by Lightcraft Workshop, the perfect tools to create the perfect image. CPM Film Tools, your lightweight solution for caging the beast. ICANN, features you need, prices you want. CheesyCam.com, the latest gear reviews and DIY video and photo projects. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of DVTV. I'm your host, Tony Reale. Today I'm going to be reviewing the Canon XA10. Now this is a new Canon camera that just came out a couple months ago and uh, it's been actually very popular. It's kind of hard to get a hold of because of its uh, unique position. It's basically a size of a consumer camera but it's got the sensor of some of the more professional cameras that Canon makes. So how does it perform? Well we've been using this for our NAB coverage, or Cinegear coverage and even right now we're using this for our DVTV show. I've been very impressed with it and I want to go over some of the pro features that I found. Uh, the pros are, first of all, image quality. I've been very impressed with the image quality. It's, I used to have the Canon XHA1, and the XHA1 had good overall image in a well lit situation, but as soon as you start getting to medium lighting, average indoor lighting without any special, specialty lighting coming in, things started to suffer really quickly. You had a lot of grain that came in, and uh, overall, it was just not a great image. But the XA10 really surpassed my expectations in this area. You know, using a 5D Mark II, knowing that the the incredible light sensitivity that it has, the XA10 really does, in my opinion, rival that in most situations. Again, I don't use the XA10 for professional uh, video film shoots. I primarily use it for our shows and stuff like that. But when we were at NAB, there are situations where we were in low light, for like at the Canon booth and other areas where there was just dim lighting, and the XA10 really shined. Uh, we didn't have to even use our, our LED light very often except for areas where we just didn't have any light pointed at the person. So image quality, light sensitivity were a big plus. Uh, another big advantage of course is the size. Now we talked about the fact that this is basically a consumer body in uh, with a professional sensor in it and the cool thing is that you can actually separate the XLR inputs from the camera and actually have it look like a consumer camera. This is nice if you just want to be in a location where you want to be inconspicuous, whether you're shooting a wedding, whether you're shooting behind the scenes stuff, whatever it may be, you want to have that pro sensor, you want to get that great image quality, but you want to be fairly inconspicuous. Now the size can be a disadvantage if you want uh, to not have that jiggle that happens when you're holding your hand out, but it's easy to use a shoulder rig. We use the shoulder rig for our NAB coverage, and this proved very easy, and it was very modular, so we could take the shoulder rig, I could stick it in my suitcase, and just have a very small camera bag for most of our coverage. So the size, I found a huge advantage, and again, if you need to go bigger to get the look of a bigger camera, that's easy. But trying to cram a big camera into a small case, this won't happen. The other pro I found was the media storage options. It's got a built-in 64 gig hard drive. So right off the bat, you don't even need to necessarily bring in additional storage. But it actually has two SD memory card slots as well. So basically, you've got tons of space you can record for quite a while. At its lowest bit rate, which is 5 megabits a second, you can record for 24 hours. That's ridiculous. Now I record at 7 megabits. Uh, just because I, I want to have that middle range, whether I might want to use it for something higher end and maintain that 1080p quality. But honestly, uh, the 7 megabits to 5 megabits are more than enough for YouTube videos. And the nice thing about you sh recording at a lower bit rate is that you don't have these massive files on your hard drive all the time. So you can archive stuff and not take up a ton of hard drive space. I literally have recorded from day one all my NAB coverage, my Cinegear coverage, and I still have room on the built-in hard drive and I haven't used an SD card yet. So that is just a huge plus, that ability to record on there and have just tons of space. Right, now not everything can be perfect. And this camera does have a few cons that I want to go over. First of all is the autofocus. Now overall it's pretty good, but if you try to stay locked on something and you start zooming in and out, or if you do rapid, any sort of rapid movement, like quick movements back and forth, the autofocus tends a tendency to search and not find the object that you're looking for. Now it does have a cool feature where you can basically touch a uh, focus point 
and basically tell it where you want. It does, of course, have facial tracking, but if you want to track like in my hand or an object or something like that, you can use that. And that works okay. But again, we found when we were doing our NAB coverage, if we try to zoom in, uh, zoom out, the autofocus was just not entirely reliable. Now, this isn't just the XA10. A lot of cameras have this problem. Autofocus isn't perfect. But again, this was an issue. So fortunately, there is a focus ring on the camera and you can switch to manual and be able to control your focus that way. So that is a plus, but again, the autofocus uh, did occasionally make life a little bit more difficult for us. Now, talking about the focus ring, uh, another thing that I didn't like about this camera entirely was the manual controls. Now, I knew going in that I wasn't going to be getting the manual controls that I was used to on my XHA1 or on the higher end cameras uh, from Canon like the XF100 or the XF300, but still, it, it, it is something that I kind of miss. Having the focus ring is nice um, and having the level of manual controls that it have. Basically, most of the manual controls I was used to on the XH-A1 are on the XA10. They're just buried in a menu and they're not as quick and easy to get to. If you remember XH-A1, there's buttons everywhere and they're easily able to select versus I got to go through a menu. It's not as quick and it's just a little bit more difficult. I don't have a separate iris ring and a separate focus ring and a separate zoom ring. I just have one focus ring and I have to control manual iris and the, have a zoom a rock or so. Again, not the traditional manual controls that you're used to on a professional camera, but it'd be almost impossible to cram it into a camera of this size. And last thing I will mention, as I spoke of before, the camera is menu driven. Uh, all the manual controls are, are buried in a menu and navigating that menu isn't necessarily the easiest thing in the world. Uh, the touch sensitive screen is what controls everything and it's okay to navigate but again it's not as good as maybe a smartphone or something that has a better touch navigation um, I, I would have preferred maybe a button control just to make things a little quicker and easier and more accurate but again the three inch screen is nice it's, uh, it's a little cramped for somebody of my you know hand size but overall I, I can use it but it's just not as nice as say some of the menu driven systems of previous cameras so overall, I'm very happy with this camera. We're going to be using this for quite a while. I like having the small size. I like having the pro sensor. I like having the ease of use of it and still being able to have XLR inputs, having all the main controls in there. I think $2,000 is maybe a little bit higher than you would expect, but once you start seeing the image out of this camera, you're going to be happy that you spent the money for it. This episode is made possible in part by Blackbird Camera Stabilizer designed to be easy to use with great performance. Manhattan LCD, the affordable solution for high definition monitoring. JAG 35, affordable solutions for filmmakers. Hi, this is John Reed with Next Wave DV. Here to talk about composition and one of the composition styles called Rule of Thirds. Now, if you watched our episode on Next Wave DV Live, I talked about my background just a little bit in photography and the fact that I shoot with a Canon 5D Mark II. If you have an opportunity to check that out, I encourage you to do so. Now what the rule of thirds is, honestly, is just why a photo or a video or a segment looks right to the eye. See, a lot of people that watch film, they don't necessarily know why something feels right, but they know it feels right. So I'll show you this example here. You'll notice in this particular photograph, and in the guidelines that are here for rule of thirds, that this actually incorporates effectively the rule of thirds. Now you're going to notice those intersecting lines. Those are four points. And the photograph or video or anything is composed in those three columns and then the three rows, which create those four intersecting lines. And the rule of thirds principle is that your eye is drawn to those points. So whether it's your top left or your top right, your bottom left, bottom right, it has a certain appeal. Now it's not to say that people don't break those rules, but you have to know what the rule is before you can break the rule. And you'll notice in film, especially, people will do certain things that make you uncomfortable when you're watching something and compose something in a way that breaks a rule, but it does it on purpose because it's unsettling to you. But the rule of thirds is a good principle to start with when you're doing video or you're doing photography because it's nice to know where your audience eyes are drawn and why it feels a certain way. I will right, we'll see you next time. This episode is made possible in part by Rode Microphones. Linco Lighting, professional lighting for photo and video. LCD Viewfinder, the essential accessory for DSLR video. Now let's take a second and talk about something that a lot of people, in my opinion, overlook, and that's camera bags. 
I actually own several camera bags for multiple situations. And I, each one of them I own because I need them, uh, depending on whether I need everything together, whether I need to be low profile, or depending on what type of camera that I'm carrying with me. Uh, so getting a good assortment of camera bags I think is a good investment and getting quality camera bags is definitely a great investment because then you know that you're going to have something that's going to protect your gear. And honestly, uh, if you spend a lot of money on a camera but you don't invest in a good camera bag, you're going to regret it because yeah, bad things can happen to your camera. You may not be able to carry the things that you want with you. It's just a bad sign. So there's several different companies that you can choose from. Uh, I own a Kata bag. I own uh, Low Pro. I have a Pelican case. There's a lot of other ones out there, but those are some of the pros that I've chosen to go with. First off, we'll start with the small end. I have this Low Pro bag. This is really nice for just if I want to take one DSLR or my XA10 uh, and a couple lenses, some batteries. I actually use this for my Cinegear coverage. I literally all crammed everything that I needed for just the Cinegear coverage into this one bag was nice and small, not very heavy. Just a great overall small bag just to have with you so you actually have a bag. Uh, next one up is my larger Low Pro bag. Now this is a nice backpack. This actually has tons of room. I kind of went over this with my NAB coverage episode, uh, but this has a lot more packing. I can fit uh, a couple cameras in there. I can fit more lenses. I can fit uh, lots of different stuff. There's also a slot on the side that I can fit my laptop in there. And I have a 18.4 inch laptop. So this is one of the larger ones and it's actually able to fit inside there, which is really nice. Uh, now I, on, on a different type of case, I have this Kata bag. Now this is really nice for if you have larger cameras, uh, if you have like a XF300 or an EX2 or something like that, this is really great because you could fit a larger camera into here. Or uh, what I use it for is when I have a kitted out DSLR rig. If I have, um, say, my CPM film tools rig, kind of all fit around it, uh, shoulder rig mounted, whatever, uh, I can actually fit a good chunk of a, a DSLR rig into this bag. Uh, but there is also the option to compartmentalize it for smaller things. And because it's a kata bag, they actually have these rugged, heavy-duty edge sides to them, which is really nice because then uh, you don't have to worry, because it's a soft case, you don't have to worry about you know banging it around. Now, this low pro bag I use primarily for when I'm shooting photography. It's nice, shoulder-mounted, quickly uh, able to access things without having to sit down or set the bag down. Uh, I have lots of room in there for even two DSLRs if I need them. Lots of room for lenses, flash, everything. And there's also specifically designed that if, for example, it starts to rain, there's a rain hood that I can unzip, take that out. So that's a nice bag, nice and lightweight, easy to take with me. Last but not least, of course, is my favorite case, my Pelican case. Now this is what I cram everything into. This is where I want it to be super protected. It's going to be uh, drug around by potentially grips and production assistants, whatever. Uh, I want to make sure that the camera gear is safe, secure, uh, but I also want to be able to have pretty much everything I need in this one case. I don't have to worry about lugging around all these small cases. So this is the case that I go to when I'm doing a film shoot and I want to have everything with me and not have to worry about multiple camera bags for everything for my DSLR stuff. So again, having a good assortment of camera bags can help you. But if you can only afford one, decide what needs that you have. Are you doing photography primarily? Are you doing video? Are you going to be trekking around that a backpack is going to be more convenient? Or do you need that heavy stability that a nice Pelican case can provide you? Want more Next Wave DV in your life? Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube to be notified when the next episode airs. Visit our website for daily posts on the latest digital video news. Like us on Facebook to join the Next Wave DV community. And follow us on Twitter for behind the scenes news and pictures.